There we go. All right, guys. <laughs> it's always something every time I'm used to it always being something. Well, there are a couple of people that have never been here before, so I like to do a little welcome and um, explain what we do. And now I see captions on the screen. I have no idea how to get rid of those. Um, I suppose it doesn't matter if it's if it comes out correct. So welcome to Austin Nonprofit Meetup, folks. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Nancy Manning, founder of Austin Nonprofit Meetup and Power Your Mission. And I did practice law for 25 years in Rapid City, South Dakota, where I where and when I served on three nonprofit boards during that same time period. Then I moved to Austin, Texas and began managing nonprofits as an executive director, did that for about eight years. And then in 2014, started my consulting business, Power Your Mission. 2018, started Austin Nonprofit Meetup. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we do each month in Austin Nonprofit Meetup. We take a topic that's relevant to nonprofit leaders and we either, we have different formats that we use. Either I'm the presenter or I have a co-presenter or we do some networking, or I'm lucky enough to find these amazing speakers like we have today who are willing to share their experience and wisdom. And so in a minute, I will introduce those folks to you. Uh, first, I do want to introduce um, Shannon. And Shannon Mantrum is here every month as my co-hostess. And she will be watching the chat box because I'm bad at it. <laughs> I, and I, I lose it. I often lose it. Um, and Cynthia seems to have trouble. Getting, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm clicking around. All right. So, Shannon, would you take a minute to introduce yourself and what you do? Hey, everybody. Shannon Mantrum. I'm the executive director of Launchpad Job Club here in Austin, Texas. And um, I'm also over the program Leap to Success, which is usually what I share here. Uh, Leap to Success does pro bono short term professional projects for other nonprofits um, because our people in the job club tend to be aged at least 45 up. We're, I like to say, fine wine vintage. And so um, even in the great job market can be on the market a little bit longer. So this gives them an opportunity to keep their skills sharp, have something more recent from their LinkedIn profiles and their resumes. And also just to give back, they, they get so excited being able to uh, to learn about new nonprofits uh, to them and uh, and to help you guys, you know, with your missions. So I'll put um, information in the chat. Uh, it's our project request form, and if you would like to reach out and fill that out, I will get back with you, and we'll just we'll get a team together and get going. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Um, okay, now for some reason, all of a sudden, my slides don't want to move. There. Okay, so you all are here today because you uh, are concerned about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And remember, I said that in Austin Nonprofit Meetup, we take these topics. Uh, they're in five focus areas of nonprofits communications, programs, research development, or fundraising, operations, and people, which are your board staff and volunteers. We take something in that one of those topics and we drill down every month. Well, this year, the entire year, we've been looking at some of those topics through a DEI lens. So in, I believe it was March, we had these speakers up here that told us about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the nonprofit sector in general. And then in June, we had the amazing Marissa DeSalas, who is, was on the forefront of community-centered fundraising. Uh, and then last month, we had Saro and Michelle talk about uh, uh, impact and how you evaluate your impact and how you do that in a participatory manner. So in other words, through a DEI lens. And so this month, what we're doing is hopefully I can, there, uh, uh, is taking our communications and looking at that through a DEI lens. And I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. And we're going to have Christopher Roby, Darian Bannister, and Kia Colbert. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my share so that they can um, start theirs. And I'd like them to just introduce themselves. <clears throat> OK. Oh, well, I'm, sorry. I'm uh, Dr. Christopher Roby. I am uh, the CEO of Mississippi Health Alliance. 
Uh, we're a for-profit organization that helps other organizations bridge the gap between uh, their programs and the communities that they serve. Uh, we've been around since 2012. Uh, we've worked with multiple institutions, nonprofits to for-profit organizations, assisting them with their capacity building organizational structure, how to organize their uh, companies from their front desk person all the way up to their board of directors, provide training and technical assistance. Anything that they need to be sustainable is our goal. We, uh, Our passion is to create sustainable organizations that last. Uh, in the nonprofit world, we know that uh, we call soft money. Uh, and we want to make sure that although you are working on soft money, you can make soft money hard. And uh -huh. our goal is to help these organizations get there. Cool. Thank you. Darren, you want to go? Okay. Hello, my name is Kia Colbert. I am the director for the Emory Compass Coordinating Center, and we are um, based in um, Atlanta through the Emory University School of Rollins Public Health. And we are an organization that provides um, capacity building through organizational infrastructure for um, organizations in the South. Um, as Chris said, Chris is actually one of our advisory board members. And um, we work with the nine deep South states. And this year we added um, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Um, and we work to um, provide these things through grants, trainings, and what we call shared learning opportunities. Nice. And I'm Darian Bannister. So well, I guess I have two titles. So one, nine to five, I actually am senior manager for health systems integration at the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors based in Washington, DC, where we focus a lot of our work working with health departments, specifically state health departments. And right now we're really focusing on in the HIV epidemic. But I'm also an independent consultant where I do a lot of focusing on board development, fundraising, um, partnership development, and really a lot of things that are really going to help your organization really up and up and run and start. And actually, I used to work with Kia and Christopher Roby at the Emory Compass Center. So it's really good to see all of these great familiar faces and working with my friends and colleagues. You know, one thing that I love about the nonprofit world is that no matter where you go, you, you tend to grab friends along the way. You know, you become more than just colleagues, you become fan, friends and you become family. And that's what we have here. And it's just good to be, uh, good to be home. I wanna say I'm home. Oh, thank you. All right, I think, Dr. Chris, you're gonna start, start us off, yes? All right, so you guys can see me now. Uh, you're seeing the presentation mode, right? There you go. You got it. Okay, so I'm going to uh, kick us off and start the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as we look at this, I already told you about who I was. Uh, also, as like Darian said, as a full-time job, <laughs> I uh, serve as the chief operating office for the Mississippi Primary Care Association. Uh, we oversee the 21 federally qualified health centers in the state of Mississippi. And so one of the things I do here is work with our health centers around their diversity, equity, and inclusion. And right now, workforce and resilience is one of our major issues, especially around since COVID has uh, tremendously impacted our workforce in Mississippi. Uh, in the healthcare field, we are identifying ways to ensure that that workforce is looking reflective of the target population that they serve within the federal qualified health center realm. So as we look at this diversity uh, focuses on, I'm sorry, oh yeah, forgive me. Let me go back, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. So as we look at this diversity, focus on the presence of differences that may uh, include race, gender, religion, uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, and social economic status and languages, as well as disability, uh, age, uh, and sometimes political perspective. When we focus on the equity part of it, it is promoting the justice and, and uh, partiality and fairness within procedures, practice, and distribution of resources by our institutions or systems. And then the inclusion is an outcome to ensure that uh, there are diverse actual, I mean, diverse actually feel and or diversity is actually filled or is welcome within organizations. 
Um, I don't like reading to people, but I do want you guys to look at this diversity table uh, that focuses on the dimensions of diversity. In the center of diversity, you always have the individual, which is you. Internally, you bring to the table your race, your age, your gender, sexual orientation, physical ability, and ethnicity. Every time you hire a, a staff person, we ask them to fill out this application. And part of the application process asks for some of these internal uh, questionnaires and we get that information from them. We don't use these as determining factors for hiring people, but it's good information to know in terms of a staffing profile within the organization. Then we focus on the external, geographic location, income, uh, civic professional activities, how, um, recreational habits, religion, educational background, work skills, these things that are external to uh, the individual that can be learned or obtained. Um, when we focus on the internal, those are things that cannot be changed. External things that you can acquire over time. And then when we look at the larger context of everything, it's the organization. Once individuals are brought into the organization, they have to, uh, amend themselves to the different contexts of the organization, like the uh, classification, the work context, uh, and developing those relationships within the job. Uh, what division or department do they work in? Uh, what does seniority look like within an organization? Is the seniority reflective of people who work their way up through organizations, or do people come in over someone with um, that doesn't have the same type of background or educational or experience background that also helps or, or could be the double-edged sword, so to speak, in terms of your diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when we talk about inclusion, we want to think about a sense of belonging. We want everybody that you hire to feel like they belong there, that they have a place. They need to feel respected and valued and seen for who, uh, who uh, they are as an individual. And there's a level of supportive energy and commitment from the leaders, colleagues, and others so that um, we individually and collectively can do our work the best. Sometimes we, uh, when we want to make sure that people feel included within the workspace, this can take on several different forms. We just don't want, well, the different types of leadership says that let's look at uh, a democratic process where everybody feel like they have a voice. But when you talk about inclusion, it needs to be meaningful. Don't just do something for the sake of saying I'm doing it. Make sure that a person's role within an organization and their inclusion has significant meaning to the organization as a whole and tie, always try to tie it back to the mission and the vision of the organization. So as we look at equity versus equality, one thing to remember, diversity does not always uh, equate to inclusion, and nor does equity equate to equality. I know you probably all have seen this, uh, this infographic before where it talks about equality, equity, reality, and then liberation. When we talk about equality, that's giving everyone the same thing, making sure that if I give $5 to Kia, I'm also giving $5 to Darian. But that doesn't make things equity. I mean, it uh, doesn't create equity because Darian may already have funds and Kia doesn't. So when you think about equity, you want to put everybody on the same level playing field. As you can see, the fence is the barrier, right? And the goal is to get everyone to be able to see over the fence. Even when you're giving everybody the same thing in equity, it still doesn't allow us to all be at the same level. But when you think about equity, it's helping bringing those up to the same level as someone else. But then we are faced with the realities of situations where, hey, <laughs> some people have things, others don't, and then some of them are even less than uh, having e equality. But the goal is to get to liberation where you just identify ways of removing the barrier. Let's take away the fence. And once the fence is removed, everyone can start to have discussions and can clearly see, and there's no need to provide um those things that help to get us to equity when you're removing the uh, systemic barriers. And feel free to stop and ask me uh, any questions at any time because we're so small. Um, so I feel like we have an opportunity to have discussion. So let's talk about the organizational culture. When we think about organizational culture, it's still the same as uh, what culture is. It's a set of beliefs, values, customs, actions, thoughts, communication, institution, and ideas that's shared by a group of people. Right. So every organization has its own culture. Uh, it, 
oftentimes you have to sit back and think about what does our organizational culture that I work in, is this culture conducive? And when you ask the question, people start to wonder and think about what are you actually talking about? How do you feel when you come to work? Does the place you work make you feel valued? Uh, do the people that you work with understand your unique perspectives and your individual backgrounds and your ideas that you're bringing to the table, which helps with that diversity? So ensuring that your organizational culture is up to par will help you as you uh, work towards the trajectory of having that diverse, diver, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I love this quote. It says, DEI are not nice to have. They are imperative to achieving your mission. Everything about your organization should be focused, mission driven. The org every organization has a mission and how you get there uh, is by having the DEI at the forefront of your organization. We get into the, uh, when everyone within the organization looks alike, act alike, come from the same social and economic background, we end up with what we call groupthink. And so to break away from groupthink, you need to have some diversion, I mean, diversity, some kind of equity and some inclusion of people with diverse perspectives because they're gonna br bring those unique perspectives to the organization and to the uh, development of your work plans, your uh, mission and the outcomes of your organizations. So how do we get there? Uh, when we look at this, let's expire. Where do we go? Uh, want to go? Identify where you want your organization to be. Then we need to assess how ready are we to get there. Then you want to uh, what, look at the architecture, like what do we need to do to get there? Identify those uh, ways and create those targets and initiatives that's going to help you get there. You have to find a way to act on them. Oftentimes, we create these beautiful work plans, these beautiful ideas, these beautiful um, action plans, and they just sit on the shelf. You really have to put these things into place and make sure that they are not just uh, documents that you create to say we have one, but actually put them into motion. And advance, how do we keep moving forward? Once you get some traction moving on your uh, DEI activities, then you want to make sure that you continuously move those uh, things forward. Don't just stop when you uh, create something. You want to have that as a continuous process, even quarterly, uh, annually, or even biannually. You want to look at where we are in terms of DEI. We don't want to hire people just to say we are uh, saying we are five blacks, we have 10 whites, we have uh, three Hispanic people work for us. We're checking out boxes. But what skill set can these diverse individuals truly bring to the table? And are we fully utilizing them and make sure that they're inclusive within our organizational practices? So this is a model for change I like. Uh, we look at the internal uh, things. How do you attract and retain people? You need to look at your recruitment method and uh, how you develop that. What are your benefit packets to uh, recruit people from uh, different backgrounds? the compensation, and also learning about uh, your organization will also help you. External factors are listening to, um, listening to and serve your society. Uh, social responsibility. Every organization has a social responsibility, especially nonprofits. Nonprofits traditionally help the most disadvantaged populations within a community. And we like to hold our nonprofit organizations accountable when they're uh, bringing services to the community. And when we do that, our products and services should be reflective of the people that we work with, as so should our staff. Your marketing material, make sure not only does your marketing material reflect the population, but it has input, which is part of that inclusion from your DEI group. And then also think about your supplier uh, diversity. When uh, we have a social responsibility as nonprofit organizations to ensure that we help smaller organizations, uh, minority-owned businesses, if there's an opportunity to utilize their services for our various activities. And then the foundation of all of this is driven by the strategy. Everything to line up with the vision, the mission of an organization, your leadership, and the structure within your organization. And then in the center of all of that, you bridge that together and align the, align the content and connect it by doing assessment, as Kia will be talking about later, developing your communication plan, and then making sure that all the activities you implement are sustainable. So the final slide for me is that we wanna focus on how do we measure our progress. First, there at the first level, you wanna see, is there any inactivity? 
No DEI work has uh, begun. That your diversity and culture of the inclusion are not part of your organizational goals. This is when you do your assessment to see where your organization is. Then you, and two, you may move to the next stage, which is number two, where you are reactive. A compliance uh, mindset where you're focusing on, we need to be in compliance with federal, state, and uh, local regulations to ensure that our organization is compliant with the law. More progressive organizations are proactive. They have a clear awareness and the value of the DEI activities, and they're starting to implement them systematically through their organization. And then for, uh, at the next stage, you have progressive uh, organizations who are implementing DEI systematically, and they're showing some improvement and results in their outcome. And ultimately, we all want to be at uh, stage five where we have best practices, where you can demonstrate your current best practices, what your organization has done to incorporate DEI activities. And then you want to be able to be an example for other organizations and help them get to the next stage of where they need to be uh, to develop DEI activities within their organizations. And that would be it for me. Um, I'm open to questions. I don't know if you guys want to have the questions now or wait to the end, but this is my contact information. Uh, you can go to our website or you can email me directly and our phone number. If there's anything we can do to assist you, we'll be happy to. Thank you, Chris. That was amazing. Um, I want to tell you something that Cynthia Herrera said that I was reminded of as you were talking. Um, and that is, where was it? You were saying something about, well, inclusion. Uh oh, and what, what Cynthia said was, if you don't involve the people you serve in every aspect of what you're doing in your nonprofit, your communications, your fundraising, your programs, if you don't ask your people what they want and need, then the only person you're serving is your own superiority. That's from Cynthia. I've repeated that a hundred times. It's such a good quote. <laughs> All right. That is so true. Uh, I think that's very excellent. We do tend to uh, develop programs from an ivory tower perspective. We have all this college and educated mindsets, and we know what the theories say and what uh, you know these beautiful work plans say we're supposed to do. But you have to go back to the basis, Cynthia, like you said, and include the target population in the development of these programs. Because the worst thing they can do, and I give you a prime example, we had a Robert Wood Johnson grant. And anybody knows it's hard to get a Robert Wood Johnson grant. And we were able to get one, and we thought we were going to create local farmer's market and community gardens. The reality was the community here in Mississippi said they didn't want the gardens. We built these gardens. We took all this money creating gardens around the city and the uh, produce died on the vines because the community would not go get it. We never included them as part of the process. And that was the uh, 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 heavy cost for us to learn <laughs> getting that money from Robert Wood Johnson because we never got another Robert Wood Johnson grant. <laughs> But it teaches us that, you know, you have to have your uh, consumers involved in every phase of your planning from the beginning to the end if you truly want your programs to be effective. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Miss Kia, are you ready? I am. Let me get my slides up. we go. Can you all see my slides? Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about communication planning and some uh, best practices. And I'll um, be inclusive of um, what Chris is going to talk about. And then Darian will round us out talking about partnerships. Um, and so as Chris said earlier, if there are any questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, if someone can kind of yell out at me, I'm sharing my screen so I won't see the chat. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and so I'll just give you a little bit of information about me and Compass. So as I said earlier, my name is Kia and I'm the director for the Emory Compass Coordinating Center. And just to give you all a little bit of um, background information about what Compass is and specifically the Emory um, Center, we are supported by Gilead Sciences. It is a hundred million dollar investment across 10 years for HIV in the Southern states. And the goal is to eliminate the HIV epidemic in the South. 
Um, and so each coordinating center um, works together and we each focus on four specific focus areas in all of us building capacity for organizations in the South. And so we work with the Southern AIDS Coalition and they focus on stigma reduction. We work with the University of Houston's Graduate College of Social Work and they focus on mental health, well-being, harm reduction, as well as trauma-informed care. And then we also work with our new center, which is Wake Forest University School of Divinity. And they work on the integration of faith-based stigma reduction. And then here at Emory University, we are focused on organizational capacity building and infrastructure development. And so our hope is that we collaborate with our community partners. We help to build sustainable organizational capacity among HIV organizations and that we can increase um, access to quality care in the Southern United States. And as I said earlier, we do this through a multitude of uh, grants that we provide, trainings and shared learning opportunities. And I won't go through all of them, but when I finish, I will live our, leave our website as well as my contact information in the chat for you all um, to, if you wanna reach out about some more detailed information about Emory or Compass. And so today we're gonna to talk about communications plans. We're gonna talk about um, what is communication? What are the types of communication? Um, why communication plans are important and what are some of the um, essential parts of a communication plan? And so what is communication? Communication is really how we reach our audience and it contains three major parts, the message, the medium and the target. And so the message is exactly what it says, what it is to be said. This is what you need to say to your audience, uh, the meaning behind the engagement that you want to have. The medium is where you're going to actually um, put your message. Is it gonna be social media? Will it be television? It could be a website. It could be um, some sort of newsletter. And the target is who you plan to reach. So who is your audience? Um, it could be an advocate, it could be a donor, um, it could be a community member, um, but anybody that you consider um, the uh, recipient of your messaging. And so there are really two types of communication. You can have internal communication and external communication. And it's really important that you figure out which type of communication you're using because that will help develop and determine the message that you are um, sending. And so at some point, you know, all nonprofit communication happens between either the internal message or it's an external um, message. And like I said, knowing the difference is um, essential. And so we'll start out talking a little bit about um, internal um, communication. And so this right here occurs within your organization. So this is when you are sending information within to your colleagues um, and it's primarily used as a function of the work environment. So simple data, it can be something as simple as day to day, you know, using a messenger or it can be a brief, um, something that you um, send to a department or um, to the team within your organization. But one of the things to remember about um, internal communication is basically, this is how you uh, reiterate your big picture goals, your mission, your vision, your values. Um, I know in our um, organization, one of the things that we did just to make sure that everybody is on the same page um, is we had an activity with our mission and vision where we kind of help had everyone in the organization to kind of think about how do we want to see or how do we want other people to see who we are. And so we came together, we had sticky notes and put you know, words up around what we think our organization represents. And then from there, we kind of cultivated our mission, our vision, our value. And then we displayed it in a way artistically that um, represented our organization. Because the, the last thing you want to do is have someone within your organization speak on behalf of your organization in some form to an external stakeholder and they're not representing what the organization is. And so you want to make sure that everybody within the organization is on the same page. And one of the ways to start that is to make sure that you are um, tight with your internal communication. And so some of the examples uh, 
of communication is um, within your staff meetings, any project updates. Um, it can be a staff evaluation, making sure that you're clear and concise, employee handbooks, any milestone celebrations, formal trainings, even spotlights within the team, um, any reminders and then announcements. Mm -hmm. And then when we talk about external communication, we're talking about the transference of information between your organization and another entity outside of that organization. Um, and so, um, as I said earlier, you wanna make sure that uh, your internal communication is tight. So when you give this external message that everybody receives it the same way. And some of, excuse me, um, common examples of external communication can be um, event invites, um, it can be a blog, it can be a newsletter, um, it can be a press release, conferences, um, anything about a live event, a website, some content that goes on your website, or a big one is your social media. You want to make sure that um, you are displaying your external communication and that is conveying um, the mission and vision of your organization as well. And so briefly, I just wanna talk about some barriers to communication. Um, sometimes what we intend to say to external stakeholders doesn't always um, convey. And so some of those barriers are speaking to multiple generations. Um, and you wanna make sure that your message, um, while you may um, try to speak to a certain lingual towards a certain um, genre or a certain um, age group, you want to make sure that you're able, that your message is able to be heard um, and accepted by multiple different people and multiple, not just generations, but multiple ethnicities as well as race. So you want to make sure that the um, information in the language that you use is does not include um, any biases. You want to make sure that you can keep your audience engaged. And um, you want to make sure that you're not using too many channels, but at the same time that you're using enough. So you have to find that fine balance within your organization. And really that's based upon the messages that you want to send out as well as the, the timing of the, organ, of the uh, messages and the capacity of your organization. Um, a lot of us want to do all of these great things. We want to use all of these great tools. Oh, we want the money to get this new tool. But if you can't use it and you don't have the staff um, to constantly engage on a certain social media challenge, it doesn't um, channel, excuse me, it does not really um, make sense because now you have um, a barrier to the communication efforts within your organization. And then some of the things that are essential um, to communication, um, that you have um, good general communication skills, um, that you have the knowledge base of the topic is nothing worse than someone trying to convey a topic and then they don't really know the general knowledge behind it because the audience will get that quicker than anything, especially when you're working with community-based organizations. Um, and that's one of the things that goes back to one of our shared values, um, which is what we call MEPA, which is the Meaningful Involvement of People Living with HIV and AIDS. And so it, you know, it makes no sense for us to talk about something that has to deal with HIV, um, because if we're fluffing around it, people who are in the community, who are doing this work every day, who are living with HIV, they're gonna spot it quickly and now you're not credible. So anything else, even if it's good information that comes after that, it means nothing. Um, and the audience does not receive it. And so you also, um, that goes with recognizing who your audience is. Before you can craft your message, you have to know who you're crafting the message for. Um, take advantage of the tools. There are tons of free tools um, online and I won't go into um, all of the tools today, um, but we, I can always follow up with you if you have specific questions on, on different tools to use for different things. And then you want to focus on the message and then also be inclusive. Um, and that goes back to what Nancy said earlier, what Chris said, what Cynthia said around um, involving the people who you are um, targeting or you um, are focusing on is a better 
password. And so now we want to know, we want to talk about what is the importance of a communication plan. And I'm sorry if I keep looking to the side, my screen is stretched out <laughs> across, uh, but my camera is right in front of me. Um, so why is a communication plan important? Um, it serves as your roadmap for your organization, how you're going to get your uh, message, message delivered, you know, before you embark on this long um journey, if you, you think about it, you're going on a trip, before you go on a trip, a, a long trip, you know, you're going to pack the right items, you want to, you're going to look at what the weather is, you're going to look at what, what things you need to bring, where do you need to stop along the way, and so you have this plan, and it's the same thing for communication, that is how you get your message out to, to your audience, so you want to make sure that you have a plan in place for how you're going to do that. And doing this helps send a clear, specific message. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about this a little later, but you also want to make sure that along the way you have some sort of um, way to measure your results, even as it pertains to communication. A lot of times we think of evaluation, we think of, okay, outcomes of our projects, but there are ways that you can look at your communication analytics, and you can see what the audience is most focused on, when your audience is most um, active, um, what things are most relevant to your audience, um, as well as um, what messages are resonating with your um, audience. And so these are just some um, of the things that are, um, important for your organization when you're talking about your communication plan. You want to make sure that you clarify, and we'll go into a little bit detail of all these, um, that you're, you're, you are providing clarity. It's nothing worse than an unclear message because then you leave your audience um, having to determine um, what you're saying. Um, and then the intention of that goes away. And we've seen that a lot in HIV um, uh, messaging. Um, not only are we wanting to involve people living with HIV, but we want to make sure that we're being sensitive and respectful um, as well and, and using inclusive, inclusive language. Um, having a communication plan also helps you reserve your organization's resources. You know, there's not this flowing river of funds for organizations that you can just spend on anything. So this helps you keep things tight. It helps you set a timeline and it helps you create some of those metrics um, that I talked about. And so clarify your, organi your organization's message. What does that look like? It looks like brainstorming with your communication staff, conducting surveys and focus group. This is the inclusivity and involving people who you are targeting or who you are um, trying to focus your message on or who you have your, your population of interest is what we like to call it. Um, you wanna talk to other people in your um, organization. You know, you may have one lens from it just because someone doesn't have communication background doesn't mean that they can't um, help give you information for your messaging. And then you wanna create a brand um, guideline. So what does your organization look like? You know, you look at, golden, if I said golden arches, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is McDonald's, you know, um, and so you want to make sure that when people see that brand, they know exactly who that is um, targeting to, and so that's a document within your organization that you can give to everyone, whether they are within um, your department, whether they're someone that starts new, um, and so everybody knows that they're looking for, okay, um, can I use this logo? You know, th they can go and see, okay, this is, uh, no, I cannot alter this logo. Oh, this can only be used in these different colors. Um, if someone asks, you know, well, how many times do you all um, post on social media? There should be a guide two times, a, you know, two times a week on Facebook. We do once a week on um, Instagram, you know, those type of things, all of that can be found in your brand guidelines because this is your organization. This is how you want people to see you. And so you want to make sure that everybody within your organization is tight on how 
they are going to portray what your organization looks like to others. Clarifying your organization's goals and objectives. You know, we've all heard about SMART objectives. So I won't go too um, in depth here, but we just wanna make sure that your goals and objectives are specific, that they're measurable, achievable, realistic, and that they have some sort of um, time focus. Reserve your organization's resources. So making sure that you have a communications budget. So you know exactly what you are um, trying to do and that you can share that with others your, in your organization, your executive director, your team, so that when you are assigning people to do different things or you're going out to look for things, you know that you, if you know that you can't afford this lofty um, design um, software, you may have to use Canva. You may have to use something that's a little more uh, budget friendly, um, or you may have to use, you know, some sort of other um, free resource. And there are a lot of them out there. Um, I think a lot of times we feel like, oh, if this is more expensive, this is the best thing. Just because it's, it costs more money does not mean um, that that's something that you should use. There are a lot of free tools that um, you can use and get the same effect of someone using a $100,000 um, program. Make sure that you have training because communication is, is always evolving. There's a new product, a new thing to help you that's easier and make sure that you have um, a specific focus and forecast. Make sure that you're not um, all over the place. We wanna do all of this, you know, all of that costs a lot of money. And so just making sure that you are specific to your, um, to your, to your organization's mission, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, establishing a strategic timeline with your communication project. So pre-planning, having a um, editorial calendar where you have things, um, your content blocked off for different weeks. So if you know that, you know, there are some awareness days that you want to highlight, you can go ahead and plug those in on your content calendar. Um, maybe you want to do some articles. You can kind of throw those in. Maybe you don't have to know what the article's in, but you can say, hey, on this day, once a week, we're going to do an article. And so helping build a timeline helps you um, with your deadlines as well as your deliverables. And it helps you set those expectations and guidelines for yourself and your team. And then measuring your outcomes. We talked a little bit earlier about um, analytics, but also progress reports for your communication. Your month, you can be a monthly report, could be an annual report. Um, it could be a communication report that you uh, give to other people within your organization as well. And so we'll move into um, the parts of a communication um, plan. And so I will say that this does not have to be exhaustive. You don't have to use all of these pieces, but for us, what we've found in our trainings, um, we have been able to um, see success with using each of these parts. And so what you see on the screen on the right side is a communication strategy builder that we use within our power communication um, cohort. So I talked earlier about um, collaborative learning opportunities that we have. And so just depending on the topic, we take organizations through a um, anywhere between three to six month intensive collaborative with a cohort. And each week or month, it just depends on the um, schedule, we'll go over a different topic um, as it relates to the communication plan. And at the end, of the cohort, you should have succinct parts of your communication plan so that you can write it out for your organization. Yeah. A communication plan is, strat is basically, like I said, a roadmap to your communication success. And so each of these are the backbone um, to your brand communication strategy. And so the first one is your mission statement. And so, sorry. There we go, um, your mission statement. And so what is a mission statement? It's very clear, very concise. It's the explanation of your organization's reason for existence. What is your purpose? What is your overall intention? Um, it supports your vision and it's clear 
um, that you denote the difference between the vision and your mission. Your mission is very, very clear. It answers, what do you do? How do you do it? Do it for? And what is the value that you're bringing? And it's very succinct. You should be able to talk to someone else about the vision, um, excuse me, the mission of your organization. It should be that clear. Um, and it should be clear to others exactly what you do when you finish talking about your mission statement. And so that is different than your vision statement. The vision statement is more broader. You know, when you think later on down the line, if you have succeeded in your mission, what does the world look like? And that's what your vision is. And so I know a lot of people always talk about mission and vision. Um, and I know sometimes people get burned out, but I know what my mission is, I know what my vision is, but if you have a tight mission and vision and everybody knows your mission and vision, when you start putting together your communication campaigns and different things coming to your organization and people want you to, can you share this about this organization? Can you go back to your mission and your vision? Does this align with your mission and your vision? If it does not, you should not be communicating it to your audience. And so when we go back to our vision, what problem are you looking to solve universally? broader where are we headed and like i said if you achieve what you set out to do within your organization what would it what would this world look like 10 years from now that's what you think when you think of your vision statement another um part of the communication plan is your executive summary this is a concise summary of your full communications plan highlighting just your key strengths and weaknesses major goals and your primary techniques to be employed within your organization. And this is um, something that you put within, it's almost if you kind of think of it, if you think of a paper, it's almost like the abstract that kind of summarizes everything about your communication plan, just the key parts of it. Um, and then also tools and tactics. That's another key part of your communication plan. What tools do you use? What what tactics are you going to use? If you think of tactics um, or what your organization does to achieve your uh, objectives. So you think of like what the what and the tools are the how. How are you going to do that? Are you gonna, what software are you use? What hardware, what platforms do you use? Um, what fonts, do you use certain fonts for certain things? Um, and we talk about that brand identity. When you're doing certain things, when, do you want people to, this to be synonymous with your organization? You wanna make sure that everybody within your organization is using that as well. And so I'll just go over a few of the most common types of tools. Um, there are content review and proof, proofing, excuse me, software. Um, and so this basically um, helps you master con complex content review processes. So you can think of these as review and approve. So say you want Nancy, you want Chris, you want Daring in to look at um, something that you've done. It's much easier. We could send each other an email or within some proofing software, you could send it to everybody and we could review it, approve it, edit it within the same thing. And so we're all seeing the same thing, all changes at the same time. Project management software, um, that, those are your what base camps, your asanas, so a way to streamline your um, roles and tasks within organizations to craft timelines, to make sure um, that everyone on your team is um, in the same, seeing the same thing, they're in check with everything. And so at every step of the process, there's someone there to kind of check off um, what's happening. And so if I get something in and I need to write the content for it, but I need Darian to do the graphics. So within the project management software, I can assign Darian um, the task of doing the graphics. And so when I'm finished with the content, instead of me having to send him an email and upload it and figure out if he got the email, I can just upload it into my project management software and hit complete and it'll automatically send Darian a, uh, information that is complete and it's time for him to do his next part in the process. 
Um, and then instant messaging software, which is um, a little bit, you know, it's less formal than email, but it's not as intrusive as a telephone call. Um, and so it's getting that information quickly from someone. And then we have video conferencing software, which we all, um, thanks to COVID, are very familiar with. Um, and um, this is a way to connect with different people in different um, areas and to be remote. Um, marketing automation software, um, this helps you um, capture your new customers. It helps you improve your marketing efficiency, um, analyze behavior, those type of things. And then knowledge-based software, you think about it as a repository of all the facts of a specific topic in one place. So think of it like your FAQs, um, your manuals, or um, a workplace. Um, you think about um, Microsoft, when you're looking for help on something, they have this knowledge base where you can find all the different topics of everything Microsoft within whatever package you're using or are, you're using within that same um, system. And then last one is uh, social intranet and internal communication software. Intranet is uh, used a lot with um, larger organizations. It's kind of like a, a website for within the organization. Um, but then internal communication software, it can be a type of um, instant messaging that we talked about earlier, or it could be something like a Slack, um, which, which is a, um, internal communications where you can upload things, you can have, um, excuse me, conversations, and it can also um, link out to different um, other um, software, such as like a Dropbox or something like that. And then goals and objectives. Um, talked a little bit about those earlier, but you wanna make sure that your goals are um, general, broad, your objectives are, are narrow, very clear, very succinct. And uh, when you talk about the actions and the goal is very general, but with the objectives is very specific. Um, measures is how you, um, how things are, are um, accounted for. And so with goals, they're not easily measured because they're broad. However, your objective should be easily measure, measured. Um, for your time frame with goals, it's more long-term, objectives are more short-term. And then pr um, the principle of your goals is based on ideas why your objectives are based on facts. And so an example is of a goal is to increase sales, but if you wanna uh, make that an objective, it's increase sales by 60% in the upcoming six months. It's very specific very um, on a timeline, measurable. And then um, another part of your communication plan are your key messages. Um, communications cannot always be controlled, but your key messages um, can. And they help you um, to prioritize and define information, make sure that you have consistency and continuity as well as accuracy, and that you can measure and track your success. Um, and so you think of your um, key messages as bite-sized uh, summations that help you um, articulate what you do, why you do it, how you are different, what sets you apart, and what value you bring um, to stakeholders. They also clarify the meaning and provide the takeaway take headline um, for you. And so I wanna make sure that when you are constructing these, um, and you're doing this communication plan that you make sure that you're not doing it in a vacuum. This should be done with multiple people at the organization so that you're making sure that you are capturing not just your thoughts, but the essence of the organization, as well as uh, when it comes to um, the messaging people who you are um, interested in being a focus. And then um, stakeholders and audience. You want to make sure that you are um, have a section specifically for your stakeholders and audience. And this goes back to the involvement of the people who you are actually um, targeting. Um, you want to make sure that um, you are distributing um, material that is specifically for your stakeholders and your audience. Um, and so think about it. Um, 
as a common example I have is when organizations send in, in excuse me, events, invites, um, they have information that they want their audience to know, but they're not looking for those audiences to weigh in with your thought, with their thoughts, comments, or questions at that point. So you just want to make sure that whatever you are sending out, that you have your stakeholder and your um, audience in mind. Um, it's important for organizations um, to take the time and resources to know who is a stakeholder, listen to their stakeholders to help understand their expectations, and then that organization can share back with the stakeholders how it is meeting those expectations expectations through starting a dialogue. Um, and just know that the stakeholders are directly um, impacted by the decisions and the actions of the organization. And so that's why you want to make sure that you are um, including them and also that this is a reciprocal relationship. You want to make sure that just as much as you are giving information that you are learning from the, the other person. And then the last part of um, the communication plan is some sort of situation analysis. And so it's a process of like critically evaluating the internal and external conditions that affect the organization. And so this is the most common type is uh, through a SWOT analysis, um, where you look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and your threats of your organization. Um, and then another one that we um, have used with our organizations is the PESTLE analysis. And that's looking at political factors, economic factors, social factors, um, technological factors, legal factors, and environmental factors of um, what affects um, an organization. And that is all, thank you. Um, does anyone, I don't know if we wanna do questions now, we wanna go ahead and move on to Darian. Um, given time, I think we'll move on to Darian. I also need about, five to eight minutes at the end myself, but I also like to save time at the end for questions. So um, unless, does somebody have a burning question they would like answered? Uh, I do wanna just say one thing, when Kia was talking about internal communications, uh, I have guidelines that I've written up uh, for nonprofits for internal communications. If anybody wants them, just email me. Uh, I have a story about barriers to communication, but we don't have time. <laughs> but it's a good one. Anyway, all right, Darian. Well, hello everyone. I'm not gonna lie. After after those two powerhouses, I don't I I, I don't I don't know what else what else more I can add. But I just have a few slides, and you know what? So let me tell you. Kia and Chris know I don't really like doing slides. I'm not that person. As a matter of fact, I even borrowed slides that I used for Compass before because it was just such a good background. Let me. So I am like really new to independent consulting. I'm used to doing this as a worker. So this is a whole new this is a whole new avenue for me. So next time you see me, I will have my own slides. But until then, Kia, don't be mad. I'm borrowing my slides. <laughs> I just borrowed these for just a moment. <laughs> And so, you know, we're really talking about partnerships with diverse communities, right? So partnerships is all a partnership is, is really a relationship. And let me tell you, there's a quote that I um, saw the other day on Instagram, because, you know, I love social media. I'm a millennial. And it said that relationships will get you indoors that money can't. Mm -hmm. And I just had to leave that with you all because that's really something that I can really attest to it within my life, within my career, within everything I've done that a relationship has gotten me everywhere. Because I've developed relationships with folks is why I can get things done. The fact that I have a relationship with Kia and Chris, I can call them up right now and say, look, uh, y'all know I'm not good with slides, but can you go, can you look at this? And let me tell you, normally that's what happens and Kia will fix those because Kia is a communications guru. <laughs> but, you know, why I wanted to go here with diversity in the U.S., because as we're talking about diversity, right, and if we're looking at the United States, a couple of just facts I had to pull from the U.S. Census that I thought was going to be very interesting as we're talking about, you know, communications, as we're talking about equity, as we're talking about just looking at the state of our country and where many of us live, especially as I'm thinking about like Texas, right, because Texas is very diverse. Like where we live in Georgia, it's very diverse. And for the first time in U.S. in U.S. history, that 
white Americans, Caucasians have for the first time in since they've started recording populations in the U.S. census has been around that um, their population has actually decreased. And that can be because of a few things, you know, as we're looking at, say, the 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 number of uh, African-Americans count for 13.4 percent, as we're looking at Hispanic, Latino or Latinx uh, populations account for 18.5 percent. But as you all look right here, where we now have where we have mixed two races that count for about 2.8 percent. And that was for. And this is not included in the last 20, the, all of the 2020 um, census because they're still calculating and coming up. You all know with data, it takes a little minutes for everyone to get all the data, get all the numbers. Y'all know the government takes a little minute, as we all know, because look at our COVID response, but I'll just leave that there, that they take a little minute to uh, get some things um, into sharing for the rest of us. But now that we're actually seeing that mixed races are, is actually being captured as we're capturing demographics, that it is a growing population, that more and more Americans identify, not just say African-American, not just say, you know, um, Hispanic, Latinx, not just say white, Caucasian, but they identify as being a part of multiracious, multi, multiracial, I should say. And that's just something I wanted to note as we're talking about nonprofits. And specifically, you know, nonprofits have been known to work um, with diverse populations and specifically um, underserved communities, which typically look like brown and black people like you know some of the folks that you see right here they typically look like look like me right and if these are the folks that we're that we're serving it's very important to know where where we are trending in in the country and um also you know i have to just say you know with the recent um black lives matter movements that uh within philanthropy and nonprofit, it's become very clear that there is a gap there is a true gap when it comes to serving serving our, our our people, and that's something that we definitely have to make sure that we're doing, especially as nonprofit leaders in this work. And then, you know, next, as we're thinking about, and that's how we get to thinking outside the box, right? As we're thinking about partnerships, as we're thinking about relationships, we have to think outside the box. Every time, you know, the thing that I keep hearing from nonprofits, I was like, well, how do I work with people? How do I, how do I find these populations? How do I, how do I work with people I haven't thought about before? Literally think outside the box. <laughs> think about something different. And when I think about developing partnerships, I look at three, I look at three, three major things, right? So when I say social networking, right? I love social networking because I'm a millennial. You know, we're the folks that invented MySpace back in the day that we invented, you know, Facebook, we invented Twitter, TikTok, all of those things. And it's really about utilizing your social media platform to really connect with these audiences. A lot of these social network tools and Facebook is like one of my favorites because there's so many groups specific to whatever you're looking for. So say you're a nonprofit in say Wyoming and you're looking for, um, I don't know, you're looking for single mothers um, that are below age 40, right? There's a Facebook group for that. And it's about utilizing these tools that you already have to find these folks. And then by going to events and connecting with people, you know, specifically, you know, in the work that I've done a lot when it comes down to HIV work, we've a lot of times just gone to the same conferences, the same HIV conferences, the same, you know, USCA is a big one, which is a really good one, but there are so many other conferences that so many other people do that we work together that we don't think about going to and meeting and connecting with people, considering that, you know, we work, we're talking about social determinants of health and it's not just say, you're looking your status living with HIV, sometimes it's housing. There are entire events that are focused on housing for um, disenfranchised groups of people. And it's about going and meeting these people. And, you know, a great, you know, <laughs> having worked at Emory University, and we have Kia here who's at Emory University, colleges, local colleges, whether they're big universities, like, you know, the, the prestige Emory, or even community colleges, they have <laughs> so many resources, and they can offer them to nonprofits for free. And also, giving internships to students. I always, that's the first thing whenever I meet someone and they're like, well, we need help doing something. We need help doing something. Offer an internship. 
Students need firsthand real world experience to getting involved. Offering them an internship to do some work for you and with you will allow you to reach new populations and new groups of people and thinking outside the box again on ways in which to connect with folks. Alumni associations are another great way of connecting with people and why not only your own alumni association, but just any university, especially depending on where you're at, you're, especially for you folks that are in Austin, utilizing those alumni associations and those alumni networks. You never know who you're gonna meet that went to a certain university that are willing to support, that are willing to help, that are willing to bridge the gaps. My own alumni association, we do community events all the time where we donate, where we give money and we participate. And that's a whole new group of folks that nobody ever thought about. And then depending on where you're located, historically black colleges and universities specifically is a whole nother avenue that people often forget about being a proud product of an HBCU. Oftentimes, not as many, um, you know, nonprofits or other corporations would think about us until until it came down to later and you would think and then now you know we have a whole vice president who's a proud hbcu alum so i just got to throw that out there she didn't go to tennessee state where i did in nashville just throwing that out there but you know she's all right with me <laughs> and then you know when you look at other nonprofits, developing mous memorandums of understanding right so if i'm a nonprofit and i do you know i provide services for homeless folks right what does that mean so does that mean, do I provide temporary housing? Do I provide uh, SNAP benefits for them to get to SNAP? Do I provide, you know, rides to get to their health appointments? I may or may not provide one or two things, but there's another nonprofit down the street that might be a food bank. So if I don't have food and they have food, why do I not have a memorandum of understanding with them that we can share our clients and work together in order to provide, to provide more work and for us to honestly think for us to do less on ourselves because it becomes stressful for us as nonprofit leaders to always doing all of the work to do everything. We always think that we have to do all of these things ourselves, but when we can actually go next door or even look in this room to see who else is here, you know, I may do this, but if you do this, we can work together. And then co-sponsoring some events. You know, we often, I'm glad COVID has been a blessing and a curse, but where the blessing that it has been is has we, have we been uh, breaking down a lot of silos? One thing that's been really trending that I love that more and more groups, organizations, nonprofits have been breaking their silos and they're starting to work together. And I'm starting to see a lot more co-sponsored events where folks are doing things together. You know, I have to say Compass is a great example. Four organizations, four major organizations came together for what, to address one issue, to address one need, HIV in the South, and look at all the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Imagine if more organizations across the South, across the country, across the region, across everyone's city would start to do more events together, more activities together. Imagine how much work you can do. You know, maybe at some point we actually can, and maybe we can actually end world hunger. Well, maybe not today, but at least we can do, we can address some issue within our local community. And then we have, so as we talk about all of these great ideas, thinking outside the box, working with partners that we haven't thought about before, um, utilizing some of our own networks that we have within, we have to look at barriers. So I got to spend a little time on trust. We have to work on trusting not only other organizations, but we have to work on getting trust from community, right? So how we talked about silos you know a lot of nonprofits have a long history with um different nonprofits for different reasons or they have a lot of history with um say city government for what multiple reasons right and there have been issues when it comes down to trusting each other to um to support one another to um address a need or even just to plain and simple share information, we have to break down those barriers and those silos in which we need to figure out a way that we can work together to address an issue. Things like this that Nancy has brought us all together to create like a, a, a forum, an area to talk, an area to share for us to get comfortable and be vulnerable together so we can trust each other to work and address some of these issues. 
and you know, I have to say cultural competence. Sometimes I, I cringe when I say cultural competence because you know we'll ever we'll never truly be fully competent on another culture besides our own. But we can get to a point where we understand, where we can have um, what's the word? Is it empathy? I want to use, but to a point where we can work with other cultures and not disrespect other folks' cultures or customs to work with each other. A lot of nonprofits have issues with um, working with different communities because there's a, there's always a level of, um, what's the word I wanna use? Well, in some aspects, there has been blatant disrespect, especially when it comes down to a lot of uh, the work that I've done in the HIV world. And we have to really work to address that. You know, as uh, we have a growing trans population, that, um, it, it, that is fully out and fully embracing and fully um, speaking out uh, for their rights. And it's so wonderful to see, but we have to make sure that we are, that we are taking a step back and we wanna learn and listen and we're not just jumping to conclusions. Mm -hmm. So if someone presents to you as, 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 um, as Jessica, even though their ID says James, making sure that we are, um, we're conscious enough to know and to respect that person, to call them Jessica. And those are just a few things when I talk about cultural competence. And it's, and it's okay for everyone within the organization to take a minute, to take a step back and encourage your staff to, uh, to do some type of training, bring in outside consultants. You know, I have to tell you, Christopher Robbie right here is actually an excellent consultant when it comes down to cultural competency. And if you didn't get his number, make sure you do that because he actually does a great training. And then we talk about communication. Yeah, I have to hype everyone up because everyone here is like really great. I think they're honestly better than me. As we talk about communication, I, I don't even, Kia just broke it down for us. Communication, and I don't think, you know, Kia said you over, there, there are ways that you can over communicate. I don't know if I would completely say you can over communicate because I feel like sometimes there's just never enough communication and just being transparent with one another, being transparent with your, with your audience, with your target audience and being transparent with your partners. If you know that you can't provide something that a partner asks you to provide, say you wanna work with the church and they ask you to provide 500 meals for X, Y, and Z, and you know you can't provide 500 meals, just say what you can provide. You don't have to sell anyone a dream or, or, or say, well, you know, we can think about doing this or we can give you something and maybe we'll come back next year. Just being completely transparent and honest about what you can provide, what you're willing to do, and you've just created a whole new relationship that can gain access to so many communities, that can give you access to, to resources that you may have not known, just by being honest and just having a conversation. And then, you know, last, we just have to talk about lessons learned. So I love this quote, cause you know, I love The Rock. He's a great actor. And I was like a big wrestling fan when I was younger. <laughs> Success isn't always about greatness. It's about consistency, consistent hard work, leads to success greatness will come oh, wow. and that's all it is it's about being consistent it's about being consistent every time the reason i have such great relationships the reason that i can call people across the country send someone an email from across the world is because we're consistent with our messaging with our communication i have been vulnerable with folks to let them know hey this might not be my skill set. This might not be what I know, but I may know someone who does, or you know what? I'm going to have to step back on that. And that gets you everywhere. Being transparent, being open, and being willing to listen and learn. I know that as leaders, we oftentimes, especially, especially executive leaders and nonprofits, you're always looked at to have all of the answers. Your whole organization always looks at you to have all the answers. Your board looks at you to have all of the answers. Sometimes it's okay to get in rooms like this, to call someone, to call one of the consultants here to just say, you know, I don't know if I have all the answers. I wanna to talk to you on how I can be better or even sharing with your staff, with your board, you know, I know a little bit, but I don't know all of it. Being transparent, open and honest can just change the game. It can change the course of how that day will go, how that meeting will go and just, it can change the course of how that program will go. 
And on that, because I don't want to take up too much time, and y'all know I don't like doing a whole bunch of slides, that is it for me. And I will turn it back over to Nancy. And I have to just say thank you so much for allowing me to be here and for sharing the stage with so many wonderful folks. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And I would love to be here again. Um, wow, you guys, I just feel honored. Um, and I'm hoping this opens doors for people. Um, I think that's one of the challenge, challenges for non the nonprofit sector is being open to having the doors opened. You know, I think I told Darian about this. Uh, there's a podcast called The Ethical Rainmaker, and that woman who runs it, oh, I can't remember her name. She challenges us every week. And one of my favorites is by a woman whose first name is LaFleur, I think, and I can't remember her last name, but it's called White Women as Gatekeepers. And it's very challenging to listen to, but I think it's very important that we constantly challenge ourselves, uh, that we who do good, like this woman LaFleur says, doing good, wanting to help, is just the sunny side of control. <laughs> I love that. You know, it's so true. And we all have to be open to, you know, those types of con uh, concepts. So how about questions? Does anybody else have questions before I do just a few uh, winding up kind of things? I just want to compliment all, uh, all the presenters. Really great information. I love, I need, I mean, it's, it's kind of put this on repeat in my head because it just needs to be continued reinforcement of, the ideas presented today. I know uh, I'm with Age of Central Texas, which is a central nonprofit locally that serves older adults and caregivers. And we're, you know, you know the why of DEI work and what you, and you know, generally have an idea of what, it's the how. You know, how do we get there? We definitely have that white tower of upper management being white. And that's, you know, so we, that's our culture, you know, because that's what's driving the bus, so, so to speak, with us. So we need to, we, you know, we're committed, and I just shared in the um, chat that we signed a contract with uh, Rachel Rosen and, and Spark, um, and we've got a, a grassroots diversity committee that that's who she's going to work with, not not me, but that committee. So, oh my gosh, it, it, I appreciate you very much, and just want to thank you. I have to roll up for another meeting, but um, again, just my gratitude. Well, thank you, Suzanne. I really appreciate that you came, and tell all my friends at Age hello, and Keep coming, keep coming, and we're here to help. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thanks, Suzanne. Anybody else with questions? Oh, hi. Um, she, oh, I can't remember your name. Cindy? Yes, you, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I hope I can get a question out of this without making it a really long story. I was working with a group here that was having an event. They wanted to appeal. We mostly get older. We also get older white women, to be frank. Um, so the person organizing it wanted to appeal to, quote unquote, a diverse audience. So she decided the entertainment would be a gospel choir, black from a black church. We did no out. They did no outreach. We just had a picture of a gospel choir in our advertising. So. Um, then, so we ended up having a largely elderly white women audience, and there were some of those people expressed concern about a re the religious tone to this event because it, it was it was a political event. Should Democrats should be no religion, you know, no religion word. So, a conversation about that caused a lot of hard feelings mm -hmm. and because they we talked about inclusivity and they were approaching inclusivity as okay well it means everybody and so it, it means the it, if you don't like the fact that we have a religious singing group here that's too bad we're being inclusive so I guess my I would love to hear some comments about we all know this stuff then when you get on the ground and you're talking to some people, someone who thinks they get it, but they really don't, is there any, how do you do it? Um, I'll go first. 
uh, one of the things that I hear is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> so uh, when you think about that, you know, the reality is whenever you're doing an event, your event should have a target audience. Um, your target population, regardless, if you, when you, even when you say you want it as inclusive as possible, you still have a, a, a audience that you're going to target. There's a particular age group. What are the outcomes of your event? Who are you really trying to reach and what do you want to get at because of this event? What are we expecting to get out of it? And with that in mind, it'll carry you back into who you need at the event. Part of what we talked about earlier is making sure that you have people in the planning phase of the event who talk about, you know, a gospel choir may not be good. I'm an African-American man. Gospel choirs don't move me either. So I'm like, you really need to think of have people at the table who with diverse ideas who can say, you know, that's a great idea, but maybe not for this event. And so having the right people at the table, oftentimes we do what we call convenience sampling, have people uh, participate in all these events in the planning because they are available and you know that they're willing to do the work, but they're not always the right people to help. We yeah. thank you for your service, but we need some diversity. We need to identify some new people to be part of this initiative. And I think that's the point Cynthia made when she made her lovely quote that if we're not asking the people who are served or that we would like to serve what they think, what they need, what they want, then we're not going to go anywhere with this. And that goes again, remember, you have to know who you're serving first because you can't invite them to the table if you're ambiguous about who you're serving. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I think, you know, you have to be clear on the message that you're trying to convey too. Cause my first question would have been who, who planned the event? Like who was at the table? Just one woman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that was the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay. We are coming to the end guys. I, I just want to do a real quick thing about this is a, another person that Cynthia turned me on to. Um, Jeremy is with, Ashwell Sexual Health and Wellness. He's going to talk about two entities, one brand, creating multiple marketing strategies to reach different audiences. This is next Tuesday. Don't forget in my Facebook group, uh, three Tuesdays of every month, I have these 15 minute interviews. And then the week after that is LA Gamar. She's going to talk about um, essentially nonviolent communications. Um, and then in October, we are going to be talking about volunteer programs and it, we have a panel. It's myself, it's the wonderful and amazing Shannon Mantram and Sheila Lowe. And Shannon, uh, tell me if I'm saying Sheila's nonprofit correctly. It is the Bastrop County Long-Term Recovery Team. That is correct. They, they go in after disasters and long after FEMA and the Red Cross have left, they are there working um, with the residents of that of that issue, and they certainly have had several disasters. They were born out of the uh, Bastrop fire, the, the worst fire in Texas history, ten years ago, almost uh, just last week, and um, they have since had to deal with floods, other fires. <laughs> so they will always be there, and they've got an interesting partnership. They're both a nonprofit, but they're partner partnered with the county, and the county definitely wants them to remain operational. Yeah, so, so when um, Darian was talking about building partnerships, one thing that we're gonna be talking about with volunteers is how do you build partnerships with other nonprofits that will bring in more volunteers, which is something Sheila will be addressing. So lots of good stuff next month, guys. And for those who are not on our Facebook group, please join us. Um, and there's my information. And Kia, and I think Christopher already sent me the slides, but Kia and Darian sent, sent me yours. And I just want to thank everybody. Uh, this has been an excellent meetup, and the fact that it's recorded will be very helpful. And it will be on my YouTube channel, but also I'll send you the, the, um, the recording from today from Zoom. Unfortunately, I won't be able to keep it up there long. So, once I send it to you, if you just download it real quick and keep it onto your desktop, uh, I think it's good, would be good, Darian, for your portfolio, I think. 
This will be very helpful. This has been fantastic. You guys are, I feel very honored that you joined us. And for the few people who came today and the others who will get the recording, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Good to see you. <laughs> Take care. Awesome. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good to see you, Cynthia. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys.